along with Mario and Metroid, Zelda is the third franchise that makes up Nintendo's so-called Holy Trinity, and with the release of the N64 in 3D gaming, Zelda was set to make the big leap into the third dimension. The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time did this, blowing expectations out of the water, and is, to this day, one of the highest rated games of all time. So, why do you need to know? The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. The mid-90s brought with it the 3D revolution. While there had been 3D games prior, the popularity and success of Sega's Virtua Racing and Virtua Fighter in arcades helped bring about the push. The Sony PlayStation brought with it games like Battle Arena Toshinden and Crash Bandicoot. The Sega Saturn attempted to hit the 3D space with its various Virtua titles and Nights into Dreams. On the PC front, games like Quake, Blade Runner, Myst, and The Elder Scrolls Arena continued to push the PC to its limits, and Nintendo was finally bringing about their 3D console. With the huge success and popularity of their prior systems, the NES and SNES, expectations were high. Eyes were on Nintendo and Shigeru Miyamoto, and how they would take their beloved franchises and transition them into the 3D space. It was in mid-1994 that Nintendo unveiled images of their new 3D console, the Ultra 64, and later, in 1995, the console, now retitled the Nintendo 64, or N64, was unveiled and playable at Nintendo's Japanese trade show, Nintendo Space World, or Shoshinkai in Japan. Here, Mario 64 was playable for the audience attending the event, and Nintendo released a sizzle reel showing off their working Zelda 64 title. As Mario 64 was so important to Nintendo's strategy, Shigeru Miyamoto, the famed game designer who created both Zelda and Mario, was set as the principal director of Mario 64. And, because Zelda 64 was being created alongside the game, Miyamoto was relegated to a supervisor and producer of the game with less of a hands-on role. Instead, he oversaw a team of directors, each in charge of different aspects of the game. This included Eiji Aonuma and Yoshiaki Koizumi, who would later become prominent figures within Nintendo. While Mario 64 completed in 1996, revolutionizing 3D games, progress on Zelda 64 was slow. It was slated for release on the Nintendo Disk Drive, an add-on plan for the N64 that would allow for much larger games. The Nintendo Disk Drive was initially planned to release in Japan by late 1996, the same year the Nintendo 64 itself was released. In 1996, the drive was delayed until late 1997, and by mid-1997, it was delayed to March 1998. It continued to receive delays until it finally released to Japan only in 1999 with a very limited launch. It then discontinued less than two years later in February 2001 as a commercial failure. Due to these constant delays and issues with the disk drive, Zelda 64 was moved over to the less powerful N64. Because of this transition, major concerns arose early in development. Shigeru Miyamoto envisioned a worst-case scenario where Ocarina of Time would have to be similar to Mario 64, in which Ganondorf's castle was a central hub with players teleporting via portals similar to Mario 64. With the completion of Mario 64 and the slow development of Zelda 64, Shigeru Miyamoto took a stronger directorial role over Zelda, and progress moved forward. As 3D was so new, companies were still trying to figure out how to convert their beloved franchises into the 3D space. Zelda 64 initially started off with a first-person view, as Miyamoto wanted players to enjoy the environment of Hyrule while the team could focus on creating enemies and puzzles. Once the team decided to make both an adult Link and child Link, this idea was scrapped so players could visually see the difference. In fact, Nintendo had to look at their own games, Mario 64 and Star Fox 64, for inspiration on how to make Zelda 64, as there were so few similar games. Everyone involved in the creation of Zelda wrote something on a piece of paper they'd like to see in a 3D game. The directors kept all these ideas as they were creating Zelda, so they could try to do things no one else had done. In November 1998, Zelda 64 released as The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. Around 500,000 people pre-ordered the game, more than tripling the highest number of pre-orders that had been placed on any game before it. In less than a week's time, the game sold over 1 million units, and by the end of 1998, over 2.5 million copies. This meant that despite releasing in November in Japan and North America, and December in other regions, Ocarina of Time would become one of the best-selling games of 1998. 
The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time managed to take the memorable action, puzzle, and adventure elements of the prior Zelda games and translate them seamlessly into a 3D space. While a variety of design differences were made to play up the 3D aspect, as well detailed in Eagle Raptor's sequelitis video on Ocarina of Time, the adaptation was mostly faithful and a wild success. Ocarina of Time didn't only sell well, but received critical acclaim. It received 40 out of 40 from Japan's Famitsu magazine and 10 out of 10s from nearly every review outlet. The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time takes players into the land of Hyrule, where the evil Ganondorf is attempting to obtain the power of the Triforce. The Triforce being a holy relic left behind by the gods who created the world, said to give its holder godlike powers. The Triforce is held within the sacred realm, locked away by three spiritual stones. Players step into the shoes of the unassuming hero Link. His quest begins as a fairy, Navi, is sent to him by the guardian of the Kokiri Forest, the Great Deku Tree. Ganondorf has cursed the Great Deku Tree in an attempt to gain the spiritual stone of the Kokiri Forest. With its dying breath, the Great Deku Tree bestows its spiritual stone to Link, and sends Link to Hyrule in order to find the Princess Zelda. Players then have the chance to explore the open fields of Hyrule as they attempt to find Zelda and the other spiritual stones before Ganondorf can. This quest leads Link to the Goron tribe of the mountains and Zora tribe of the Zora domain as Link follows his destiny to become the hero of time and wield the legendary Master Sword in order to face off against Ganondorf. Once players successfully complete this quest, finding the Master Sword and unlocking the Sacred Realm, they find Ganondorf was two steps ahead the entire time and has been waiting for Link to open the realm so he can enter himself. This sends Link seven years into the future, where he reawakens as a full-fledged adult, ready to take on Ganondorf's new evil world, and a true quest to stop Ganondorf begins. As Ocarina of Time was initially intended for the Nintendo Disk Drive, the converted game on the N64 ended up being the largest game Nintendo had created at the time of its release. It was the first adventure-styled cartridge-based game to invoke a fully explorable world without the use of a hub, and set the tone for future adventure games upon its release. One such important feature Ocarina of Time included was Z-Targeting. Inspired by a theme park's Playhouse Ninja show, General Director Toru Osawa explains, We ducked into a playhouse to cool off. They were doing a ninja show. A number of ninja were surrounding the main samurai, and one lashed out with a kusarigama. The lead samurai caught it with his left arm, the chain stretched tight, and the ninja moved in circle around him. This inspired the team to try and implement a one-on-one -on -one fighting system. Z-targeting allowed players to target enemies and characters, which would in turn make the camera track and follow whatever was being targeted. This allowed players to easily track enemies in the 3D space, and would send projectile attacks to whatever was being targeted. It was the first time such a camera system had been implemented in a game, and became a standard feature within video games, and in particular action games. From Assassin's Creed to Kingdom Hearts to Dark Souls, targeting an enemy is a common element today and started with Ocarina of Time. One of Ocarina of Time's prominent features was in its ocarina itself. Upon leaving the Kokiri Forest, Link's friend Saria bestows him with an ocarina that he can use to play music. This music was a prominent feature of the game, and players were often required to utilize the ocarina both to solve puzzles and help ease in progression in the game. The ocarina is vital to the plot itself as Princess Zelda desperately gives Link the ocarina of time as she's being pursued by Ganondorf. It's this very ocarina which finally allows him access to the sacred realm. As the ocarina was so vital to the game, there was a massive spike in ocarina popularity in real life. Zelda fans across the world sought out ocarinas of their own, and vendors selling these saw a huge increase in their business, with many adapting to the popularity of Ocarina of Time by making ocarinas crafted similar in style and color to the instrument used in the game. This also set a huge contention about the pronunciation around the word ocarina, and something that's still regularly argued. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if this video receives comments from people complaining about the way I pronounce Ocarina, and possibly stopped watching because of it. Ocarinas have been transformed in shape and style over the years, and supposedly originated as long as 12,000 years ago. These instruments were important in Chinese and Mesoamerican cultures, and eventually went on to become a popular toy instrument in European communities. What's considered to be the modern Ocarina, as they've changed in shape and style over time, is believed to have been invented in the 1860s by the Italian Giuseppe Donati. According to both the Webster and Oxford dictionaries, Ocarina is pronounced Ocarina, so the game would be The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. However, in Italian, the word is pronounced Ocarina, and the Japanese katakana for the game refers to it as Ocarina, or Ocarina. So it would be The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. In other words, both pronunciations are technically correct.
On the topic of ocarinas, another lasting element of the game was in the music itself. Koji Kondo, famed creator of the music for both the Super Mario Brothers and Legend of Zelda franchises, once again returned as the composer on Ocarina of Time. This presented a major challenge for him as he had to compose many of the tracks around the limited scale of the in-game ocarina. Fortunately, he pulled through and the music became an unspoken character in the game, further helping to immerse players into the land of Hyrule. The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time went on to become one of the most influential 3D games of its era. Despite being relatively late to the 3D party, releasing two years after Mario 64, which truly set the trend for platforming in a 3D space, Ocarina of Time brought about its own innovations. In particular, these included an interwoven 3D world in an adventure title, and Z-targeting, a feature that would become integral to 3D gaming. Ocarina of Time still remains one of the highest rated games ever made, and even to this this day is ranked as number one on Metacritic's compilation of game reviews with an aggregate score of 99 out of 100. In both 2008 and 2010, it received a Guinness World Record for the highest rated game ever. Nintendo went on to re-release the game multiple times to the GameCube, Wii, and Wii U, and Nintendo even utilized the game to help market its handheld, the 3DS. The Nintendo 3DS was released in early 2011 across the world, with The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time 3D releasing to the handheld in June. June. To this day, Ocarina of Time still regularly receives praise from fans around the world, with many considering it to be the best game in the Zelda franchise. It's often ranked highly on compiled lists of must-play games and best games ever created. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed my series You Need to Know. If you did, then you may enjoy my comedy retrospective series The Super Shows, or my Chronicles of Gaming show. Also, a huge shout out to my friend Matt, who's helping me produce this series. And I'll see you guys next time. Peace.